Hi, my name is Leo Binkowski. I'm a software developer based in Ottawa, Canada with over four decades of experience in a wide variety of evolving technology. Today, I'd like to tell you about how I had the most exciting software development experience of my life back in 1982. Please join me on my adventure I call the Ghost of Nebu Pass. That's me on the left in 1984 and me as I am today, just for comparison. Oh, pretty cool, huh? Um, in my last year of high school, my computer science teacher asked me to help design a computer camp that would run that summer. He recruited seven students, including me. I used my experience writing demos at computer stores to write 12 computer-based training programs that I would teach kids everything they needed to know and more about the Commodore PET and computing in general. I also made sure that each module contained little animations to make points, like string handling, drawing, etc. We ran the computer camp for six weeks. We were profiled on local TV because we were the first of its kind in the area. This caught the attention of Michael Bate at Nabu Manufacturing Corp, who sent Chris Wallace to interview us and ask us if we wanted to work as part-time video game programmers. He told us to call him the next day, leaving us each his business card. For me, it was like a religious experience. I was being offered a job doing exactly what I wanted to do. So, a little bit about Nabu. Nabu was formed by Canada's version of Steve Jobs. His name is John Kelly. With the funding of a local real estate mogul named Robert Compo. And they pulled together five companies. One was called Andacom, which was the maker of computers, the Andacom 1100, which became the NABU 1100, and which was actually a Z80 computer with a wood case. As I like to say, uh, it was IKEA in a box. Um, the NABU 1600, which was a 16 bit 8086 computer that was supposed to be a business multi user computer. And, um, and it ran Cunix. It all, the other companies were Bruce Instruments, local maker of channel boxes uh, for TVs and pay TV, uh, Mobius Software, which was a software consulting firm in Ottawa, uh, Computer Innovations, a computer dis distribution of Apple IIs and PETs and other computers as well, and Volker Craig, uh, manufacturers of video display terminals. Um, and they, were, they, had a, they had a bunch of models, so they were a good fit for NABU. Nabu's new purpose was to build a home computer that would connect to the cable network in a two-way manner. Essentially the first internet, except with an 8-bit computer with video game graphics. The computer itself was a Z80 with a TMS 9918 and an AY8910 uh, sound, sound chip. Essentially the same configuration as the upcoming MSX computer from Japan. It was the cable distribution that was the magic, though. Unfortunately... For us at NABU at the time, the local cable companies had a rat's nest of old cable and was incapable of being two-way. So NABU used a broadcast model. We broadcast 10 megabits of data repeatedly every 13 seconds. This was all of the NABU content there was in the 8-bit world. Let that sink in for a bit. NABU launched a cable modem in 1982 that delivered data at 6.3 megabits per second to a smart unit that could be used to read data or play games. The only thing that held it back from being a two-way system was the creaky foundation of the cable system in 1982. Computers were rented for 20 bucks a month for a basic educational uh, for for a basic and educational tier of content. Other premium tiers of content like ones with Namco games and the Konami games, there was a business tier as well. Um, what might be an extra 10 bucks per package, but consumers could add and remove tiers like they could today in in any subscription service, but they could do it quickly uh, at the at, at a monthly basis. So it was an ambitious goal to build a computer, a distribution system, and the bunch of content all at the same time within a very small period of time. And that's, but that's what NABU set out to do. So getting back to NABU, uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, I, when, I, when I was joining NABU, I tried to reach Chris Wallace by phone, but the reception said he wasn't there. She asked me if I wanted to speak to his boss, Michael Bate. He told me to come down to the Auto Cablevision building in Ottawa. I went there the same day, and I was hired as a part-time games programmer for the princely sum of five fifty an hour. Our first development machine was the NABU 1100, that thing up there. Um, and that one's actually one of our game systems, the one that you see, because that front panel there is the, the development panel. I got, I got this, these photos from Santos' site. He, seen, he got one of them. That might even be mine. I don't think so, though. Uh, but as you can see, it had 8-inch floppies, and that's what we used to develop. They ran CPM. Um, actually, a modified version of CPM called CPM MCP 1.8 because it used that board that's up there to uh, essentially, uh, 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 that was the, the HCC, the, the NABU PC as it was when we developed it. It was the prototype NABU PC that went into that system. 
So I was brought into the back of uh, the brought, uh, uh, to the back of the Cablevision building, and uh, where I met the crew that was already there, uh, uh, a really cool guy named Ken Shimizu who's working on a 3D tennis game. Arthur Ham was working on the backgammon game. Dale McDonald was working at the skiing game at the time. Uh, Todd McNaught, who was working on Demotrons, and Tim Ranger, who was also part time with Todd McNaught, working on Laser Attack. Um, I sat I sat back to back with Ken Shimizu. Uh, and I got started learning everything I could from him because he's one of these guys that's kind of like a, a, a Mozart. He's one of these guys that can be very, very, very abrasive, uh, but he's so smart that it's, he's worth hanging around because everything he says is worth grabbing and learning from. Um, about a week after I showed up, three other friends from the computer camp drifted in to get jobs. In August 1982, Chang Chao and Laura Senning were just 17 years old and Greg Adams was only 16. Chang got paired up with Dale McDonald. Arthur Hamm took Laura Shenning and Greg Adams under his wing. Nabu didn't set any goals for us the first month we were there, but I set goals for myself. Since I wasn't yet working on any game, I started work on a genre that I knew nobody was servicing. I was building Maze Chaser software, and I was thinking about Pac-Man the whole time. By October, Nabu had given us assignments. I was to begin work on a roulette game. Laura Shenning was going to build a game called Runes, which is kind of like Hangman, where you have to construct letters. Greg Adams was assigned to make Ping, more or less a re Nabu remake of Pong. And I think Chang Chao was starting on Blackjack around the same time. Ken and I worked on the roulette together because we really wanted to add a kind of 3D animation to the wheel. In fact, we had a company called Atkinson Film Arts create onion skin animations for the wheel. Ken did all the wheel and ball animation and code for that. And I handle all the betting, bank, and payout functionality. And then there was the Johnny Hart connection. So Nabu was, uh, had a whole suite of games based on the comic strips of Johnny Hart, specifically BC and Wizard of Id, which was very popular in newspapers up to his death. All the Hart games were originally programmed by Artec, but they were fixed and spruced up with Nabu standard menus and help before launch. Johnny Hart had actually visited us at Nabu in the Outback and later. He drew a dinosaur about to eat an ant on our blackboard, and we never erased it. Because it was a work of art, of course. But uh, that blackboard has probably lost the time. I don't know who got it. In December 1982, we I was finishing up roulette. And I had purchased a 1973 Cadillac Fleetwood for the winter <laughs> for my brother and burned through many gallons of gasoline driving to Nabu. I couldn't park at the college, so I just walked it to it and back home. The development department grew by a few people, and, I, and there was people working on education, so we needed to move to a nearby building for office space, and this was called the Roosevelt Building. It was on Roosevelt Avenue in Ottawa. Since roulette was done, I continued to make the chaser game. Chris Wallace saw it coming together one day, and at that point, I definitely had the Pac-Man character, ghosts, and rudimentary functionality combining and, and combining all of the elements. Chris decided to make it his mission to land the actual Pac-Man rights. I thought he was nuts. His enthusiasm was infectious, so I was given the official go-ahead to work secretly on Pac-Man. Secretly? Everyone in the games department knew I was working on it. I couldn't keep it much of a secret because people would come by. During this time, my working hours had steadily increased from 20, 30 to 40 hours a week, all part-time, and I was tasked to deliver a Tier 1 video game all by myself. Arthur Ham pushed me to add polish to the limit, even making sure I added detail of whites of the eyes to the ghosts, just to make sure it was the best-looking Pac-Man outside of the arcades ever. Also during that time, Warren Belkin started work on the NABU menu that you see up here, and the NABU network, uh, and the NABU network Starfield animation, the iconic animation that you see right at the beginning. And also around that time, we got a new boss. John Short became our boss. Uh, he became the head of the games department, which was really, really good because up to that point, marketing was essentially running the games department, and we had people that weren't developers. They were, they were producers, but they were they didn't really understand software development that 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 much. Actually, I didn't really understand it that much at that time either. Um, uh, but we got John Short, who had a, a lot more experience, and uh, John held the helm that rowdy crew that was the games department for, during the craziest time, and became a personal friend of mine. And all around that time, all of the other computer cramp crew were all finishing up their first games. They all looked really, really good. However, there was a problem. There was a lack of consistency and standards across all controls, actions, keys used, and everything. Our QA was that we got each other to play our games and mercilessly mocked each other when we, when we found bugs. 
Typically, we fix them almost instantly just so we could get to the next mocking. But then QA was formed. Uh, Nabu repeated its weird experience of hiring high school students to write games and hired a bunch of high school students to QA games. They came up with a standard form for reporting issues and also a list of standards they adhere to. The super hilarious part is that we weren't informed that any of this was happening at all. One day, each of us got an inter-office memo envelope that contained many page reports on our games. They were brutal, not adhering to menu standards, which they hadn't communicated to us yet. All excruciating misscalings that we'd all done. <laughs> Craig Adams was the worst of this. We used to call him a master of bad spelling. Normal bugs all the time. Perhaps more than a normal amount of snide comments in them. It didn't go very well initially. Uh, it was really kind of a verbal food fight on paper. We had a response column that became equally snide. I mean, we didn't fix the bugs in the spelling, and but it was a tense relationship. <laughs> the most famous incident came from the third round of comments for Ping. Greg Adams' first game. Greg angrily wrote in the final comments of his report, These reports are too big! I was slouching in a chair nearby eating chips when I saw the response envelope. That, and, and he opened that envelope and exclaimed, What the hell is this? The QA report for Ping was photocopied and reduced maybe 10 times until it was like 3 inches by 1.5 inches. It was amazingly still readable if you had a magnifying glass, but it was a little difficult to write in the response column. It was one of the funniest pranks I've ever seen played on a cranky developer. Eventually, the game and education developers got a say in restructuring the QA reports into something less mockable and more useful to both sides, and they became an integral part of the development process. And also, and this is happening around Christmas, I just wanted to add that three of us showed up on Christmas Day after opening presents and worked till we had to go home for Christmas dinners. As a result, QA complained about our timesheets. However, there was keycard access log and other witnesses to our crime of completing our work on Christmas Day. Now, the pre-launch hairball. Everyone was working on their game. And then we found out that Nabu managed to no negotiate three titles from Namco, not just Pac-Man, but we got Galaxian and Dig Dug as well. Tim Ranger started working on Galaxian at that point, and it was ki kind of was because it was close to laser attack, um, but also just because he was available. Uh, Greg Adams started to work on Dig Dug with, with, Dig Dug with John Short, but then mostly because it was far too complicated a game for one person, and Greg was part-time. Um, but... John, Greg was also busy with school, and John Short was our boss, so a lot of us sort of chipped in at different times to, to, to push that one over the edge. I was mindful of the cone of silence, like gag order over, the, over talking about Namco, when I submitted the floppy containing the binary containing Pac-Man to network operations, the equivalent of DevOps today. I panicked about secrecy when filling out the form and stupidly called the application hairball to keep it secret. Unfortunately, I didn't check the box that indicated it should be hid from the menu but available with a shortcut. But I needed to put up on the cycle, so QA could test. Within one hour, everyone in the company with a NABU on their desk was playing hairball. The power of instantaneous software distribution was demonstrated in spades. We really wanted to have a NABU chess. I already knew about Sargon from, from the Apple II days. In the summer of 1983, I decided to take a few days off to go visit my brother in Toronto. While I was there, I visited this place called the world's biggest bookstore. It really was. I don't know if it was the biggest bookstore, but it was the biggest I'd ever seen. A whole basement of computer books was available. I couldn't believe my luck when I found one copy of a book called Sargon, the Computer Chess Program by Dan and Cass Spracklin. It actually contained the full Zeddy source code for the game in, Z in 8K, minus a user interface. You just put it in a graph. So I ran outside and found a phone booth called my boss, John Short, back in Ottawa, and told him what I found. He told me to buy it. I said I did. When I returned back to Ottawa, I met with John and Chang Chow, who had just finished the blackjack game. He typed in every last line of code out of the book and made a very nice set of chess pieces for the board that were used throughout development. Close to release, though, the chess pieces were redrawn into fancy versions that looked good, similar to the Apple II version. But Chang, and I, and the others thought the original pieces illustrated the positions better and were easier to read. He left the previous pieces in via cheat key, which I don't remember. So maybe we can find it sometime. Um, by then, uh, I wanted him to do an opening for, for just like we had for Zot, which was a really, really big opening. And I said, we're going to do the longest opening because it's a chess game. And so if you take a look at the, the animation for chess, which is 
uh, just a piece moving after the sun comes up and sun, sun goes down. It definitely is the longest opening animation we have. And uh, it was really amusing to storyboard that one for him. Um, and what's funny is, is some people loved it. Some people hate it. You could, you could zip by it. You could just press a key and get by it. But some people just loved it. I don't know why. Um, the Great Pay Raise. In July of 1983, Nabu was hiring new full-time content developers, games programmers, education tool creators, and so on. I was flying high with two games under my belt. I was working on fixing WizType at the time, which was a hot mess of bugs, screen artifacts, and bad use of timing loops. I was also attacking a stack of QA reports for games that weren't mine but needed fixing. Uh, backgammon, uh, I, uh, which was written in PL1. Ooh. And uh, uh, I, I remember just there was like 20 different games I was working on. Um, uh, uh, one was Zot, another one was Alpha Blast, another one was UFOs, all mostly to add the new standard keys and menus that had been agreed upon with QA. I called it janitor duty, but in truth, I loved working on everybody's code. There was Pascal, there was Fortran, there was C, and I was learning those languages while I was doing that because I would, had to figure them out. As July 1983 rolled around, I noticed that Nabi was setting up a computer camp. Hooray! Just like I started with. So I went and visited them and talked to them and so on. And um, one of the counselors, who was a diehard gamer, was really excited to meet me and commented that I must make a lot of money. I pointed out I was part-time like him. He told me he made 10 bucks an hour. I had, had him confirm that amount, went straight back to the games department <laughs> and told all the part-time developers what I learned. Then I went straight to my desk, wrote out a resignation letter, including the reason I was leaving, and handed it to John Short. I was almost out the door when my, with my most important personal belongings when John caught up to me and asked me to discuss it with him. We found an empty meeting room. I wasn't there when all the other developers talked to John, but I do know the aftermath. They got all decent raises. And in my case, I was offered full-time employment at NABU, as requested. I don't remember exactly what, what I started at, but it was something in the range of 25 k a year, Canadian. I never really left college. I just never enrolled for my final year. So I'm sure that uh, you're familiar with the concept of Easter eggs. They're usually signatures or in-jokes uh, uh, that, that we developers show to our friends to prove that we did something and just to do something cool that nobody else sees. We were inspired by the folks at Electronic Arts uh, who actively promoted the, uh, their names of Annie Westfall and Don Freeman and Archon and Light in the Dark. Marketing thought it was a great idea until the vice president of marketing at the time, Keith Soley, rejected the idea think, uh, because uh, we, were told, uh, we were told all kinds of bizarre reasons, but we believed that it was because they were afraid of us getting poached. Um, and that, 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 that fear was, uh, was, was not unfounded. Um, so several us so so what, since we couldn't show put our names in the game, uh, and you'll see in Pac-Man code when I release that that they, I put it there and I still have it in as a comment there. Um, but I know of at least four different Easter eggs that were added. That one shows my name, and you can see it right here. Programmed by Leo Minkowski, sound by Laura Shenning. And in order to get this one, we're uh, I'll, I'll 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 show what you have to do with it. But Minor Twenty Four Nine has one that I do know about. Sargon, I don't know what it is, but I know it's there. And Laser Attack, definitely. Tim uh, Tim Ranger can actually do that one, and I'm going to try to get him to do that someday because it's a great, it's it's another great Easter egg and another neat little thing that's lost the time. Um, so, and and on Minor Twenty Forty Nine, I'll I'll give I'll give a clue. If you jump in a certain spot on the tenth on the tenth board, up and down over ten times. Then on the next time that you see the board redraw, it will redraw with our names and a message from Okeen to his family and a message from me to somebody else. Uh, I'm not going to say anything yet about that. You can find it yourself. Now, in the case of Pac-Man's Easter egg, specifically, I'm going to show this. What you'd have to do to get it, this is your special extra bonus that I didn't mention at the convention. Um, if you eat that dot, let's see, where is that? Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. That dot last on the second board, the next time the board is drawn, after, so after the next animation, or the first animation that's run, you will see that message come up every board thereafter until the game is over. You can eat the words. They don't give you any more points than they used to. Um, uh, but you can eat away at them. I thought that was a nice little side effect when I added it. 
Uh, it was kind of cool. And the sound was definitely done by Laura Schenning. Um, she didn't spend a ton of time on the sound, but I thought she deserved credit because I always thought everybody deserved credit for the stuff that they did in our games. Um, and and uh, I think she spent uh, probably about three weeks on it, but still, it was a tremendous effort. And it sounds really, really good. It's very, very close. Considering we had to do it with the AY3 uh, chip, uh, it, the waka waka sound was incredibly difficult to deal with. That I can tell you right now. We socialized together a lot. We had two separate ball teams, <laughs> like actually they're three pitch really, but they were kind of social ball teams. They weren't because they, there was actually kind of some kind of professional league going on, but we weren't interested in that. Um, and but we'd also we had like three separate Halloween parties. Uh, 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 we had we were out several times a week with everybody for different reasons, but mostly because we were there at Nabu a lot of the time, so that we'd go out and get something to eat or get something to drink later, um, just when we were trying to unwind. Uh, and that was fairly regular. That was the, we were we were more of a family than in most companies I've ever been in. So the launch was kind of a, a huge hit, and it had a lot of fanfare in Ottawa at the time. We had actually a soft launch in September 13, but because we had so we'd have a lot of units out in public when we did launch, and the local excitement was really high. Um, we had lots of initiatives going on in schools for education, so we had lots of uh, 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 stuff sent out there. And at the time as well, I just as, as a little bit of trivia, um, um, uh, Tom Wheeler was president of NABU at the time. The, 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 the chair of the FCC during the Obama years was president of NABU. And he wrote, he, we have here, uh, Wired.com, he wrote an essay about net neutrality and why he has a personal beef about net neutrality and why cable companies are evil. Um, so what he does, what he does is he said what our experience was with NABU in this essay, and it's 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 fascinating because he points out that they're acting like gatekeepers and preventing technology from coming into existence, and that was his interpretation of why NABU failed way back when. It's very interesting reading. Um, I got recognition. Uh, this one I haven't told a lot of people about because I didn't want it to get out too much. But in January 1994, I received this letter uh, that came in an inner office mail. Like, we get a QA report in. It contained a letter from Namco praising me for my effort at building the Pac-Man game. And I was very happy to get it at the time, but I tried not to brag because I didn't want it to cause any resentment. I was acutely aware that other people who worked on Namco titles didn't get similar, similar treatment. So here is that letter. And it was sent by Namco of American appreciation of level of work and attention to detail I took with the Pac-Man game. I always kept it as something to use as a work reference letter, but I never had to pull out this nuclear bomb. Um, uh, but it says the purpose of this letter is to express our appreciation to NABU for a fine job your company did in programming the Pac-Man video game for use over the NABU network. This game conversion is very faithful reproduction of the original coin-operated version. I would like to stress our particularly uh, uh, our particular appreciation for the work done by your programmer, Leo Binkowski, our approval procedure was greatly simplified by Mr. Binkowski's careful and skillful attention to the details of the Pac-Man game. We are confident that the initial fav favorable experience with Nebula set the tone for what we hope will be a long and mutually beneficial relationship. What I found out afterwards was that um, the, Pac the, the version of the Pac-Man I did was demoed, and that was what allowed us to get Dig Dug and... Uh, uh, Galaxian's titles. So that's why they started a little late in the game. I just started because I was trying to build something and it ended up being something really cool in the long run. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. Before I get to the iceberg, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about Manu 2049er um, uh, in, in the summer, the super ramp up. In the spring of 1984, we got a few new developers and a bunch of new licenses to deal with, namely the, the, the Namco ones. But another one that we're, uh, then I started work on uh, a game called um, um, Minor 2049er with, uh, right there, with uh, Joaquin Fernandez. Um, and we also had, uh, it, was, it was his first game, and I was really excited to work with him because he was a systems guy, so he had a level of experience of stuff that I never even knew about. So it was a lot of fun working with him, um, and we also got a contractor named Pat Allison to finish up the, the drawing of the screens so that we could finish up by May, uh, because I quickly had to move to doing Qbert, uh, and I worked with uh, um, uh, Qbert uh, 
uh, with Tim Ranger on Qbert, and it took, we did this game in record time. We carved up what we needed to do really quickly, and all of I think we each took about six weeks, and I think there was another week of integration. Uh, so it was super fast, under two months, uh, and it was one of my favorite gigs because it was just so tight um, and, and, and it was so easy to do. Uh, I remember, though, I was stuck on one thing about uh, building stuff, and I was going to a ball game, and I literally got a ball in the head because I was thinking about how I can do something. <laughs> um, that was kind of interesting. Um, we had a really, really, really good graphic artist. It was Edmund Hum, uh, and he did the Minor 2039 uh, graphics. Tanya Thompson redid the 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 the... the, the Bounty Bob graphics for me because I drew them by hand and I thought they were excellent. But then when I had an artist look at do them, I went, wow, these guys are a lot better than my crappy five-year-old uh, drawings. So uh, that worked really, really good. Tracy Gonzalez was really neat. And, and, and Glenn Wright from Atkinson Film Arts. Now, they did some of the video game animations. They did marketing material. They did newsletters and all kinds of stuff. So they literally were jacks of all trades of everything involving art at NABU, and that was really fun to work with them. Uh, it was nice to have, nice to be introduced to a, to, to a completely different non-engineer side of work, which was literally done in, uh, uh, with uh, um, our graphic arts department. So now... We hit the iceberg. <clears throat> so in late September of 1984, Robert Campo, a primary investor in NAB, this is right after my my, my video appeared on, on, on regional contact. Um, we ran into the, the the primary investor ran into financial pro problems with his real estate empire. There's a lot of uh, uh, talk about what exactly occurred with that. Uh, all I know is there was all kinds of weird stuff. A lot of uh, invasion of taxes and that kind of stuff, and Robert Campo ended up in Switzerland. How that all happened is something for another day. But when his empire crumbled, it also included stores like Bloomingdale's and so on. But Nabu was one of his riskier ventures, and it was first on the chopping block. And when it came to a halt, it did so in a very short time. However, computer innovation split off from Nabu and was still making money selling computers and so on. It become its own company and rebought all its sending NABU shares. So I broke even on my NABU shares. And the NABU broadcast technology went to international data casting. Um, and they went on to use it to provide broadcast data to music networks and so on. So that's where that, so that's datacast.com, uh, where that, that's which still exists. They, they still uh, do broadband distribution. Um, so then, Everyone was laid off with the exception of around 35 people who ended up joining uh, 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 NABU, uh, uh, it was 605-477 Ontario Inc., but I call it the, the NABU Network. And it included some people doing building and payments, a small sales group, a couple of repair technicians, and four from the development group, Les Perley, John Short, Todd McNaught, myself, and Tracy Gonzalez from Graphic Arts, and Michelle Couture from, from Marketing. So that kept our newsletters and all the other stuff going, and all the games and utilities and stuff that we had in progress were still had people working on them, which was wondering. And we actually did manage to do a fair amount of contact during during that time. Um, things like Paint Pot, and Music Maker. We did an update to Managers Baseball for another roster, um, which was Managers Baseball is a great game, by the way. It's uh, 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 which is like rotisserie baseball. It was one of, the, of my favorites to work on. Um, I also wrote NABU Filer and C during that period in Casino Bingo, uh, which is just because Les Perley saw it while he was on Las, uh, a game that was similar in Las Vegas on vacation, so we created another gambling game. Uh, gambling games, people like the gambling games, parents especially like them for whatever reason, and I thought they were good as well, so I liked having whatever we, we could. I wanted to make a craps game, but I never quite got around to it, just because I thought that was such an easy game to play. Um, the cable, the cable company was used to handling all the billing packages before. So what happened was is that we split off from them and we had to create our own billing system. And that was written in another Canadian piece of software called Zim by John Short and Les Perley. And I maintained it eventually. But it was didn't last too long. And eventually, uh, everybody else got laid off, including me. Um, and I call that situation Nabu by a hair. Um, and John Kelly was working on an arrangement to have RCA buy NABU outright and make it an RCA product. From all accounts, the people at RCA working on a deal were very excited because it would be brand new product space for the venerable company. I'm told the deal made it all the way to the meeting of the board of directors and apparently it was sunk by the CEO at the time who thought it wasn't going anywhere. Rumor, true, I don't know. But it was a good story. 
1985, another layoff occurred, and the development group was let go, just a small group of employees to keep going. And I was also laid off, so I took the summer off, and I enjoyed it immensely. And I didn't really care about my future for the next couple months. In September, John Kelly called me. He asked me to join him for dinner at the Laurentian Club, a high-tech business social club. You need a tie and jacket, he said. And I'd never, he had never seen me with one either. So he invited me to become the director of content development for the last round of NABU, which I call NABU by a hair. And uh, um, we, didn't, we had not a lot of money left, so I was looking at saving some money for us. So I got, us, got me a couple of high school students that I knew of from Glebe High School, where I went to. Uh, Paul Huggins was a really clever uh, programmer, uh, and he did uh, Minesweeper, or sorry, Moonsweeper and Dragonfire, and Peter Chow was the brother of Chang Chow, and also really intelligent. He was like a chess master. He had a super high score, um, and he uh, did a lot of the graphics. He was really good at the graphics, and he did a little bit of the code, but he was mostly super good at visualizing things, and I really enjoyed having him for that. Uh, but in April, 90, April 1986, things were going downhill. Subscriptions and payments were down. I could tell because I ran the reports. Uh, I knew that John Kelly was paying her salaries, and I felt bad about that. Um, I also knew that I was working on new non nabu deals, ones that didn't include me. So I was contacted by Chris Wallace, the guy who originally offered a job at NABU in 1982, and his small company was working in the media industry in Toronto, and he wanted me to write a video game that would be really neat called Tour of the Universe. So I did. I accepted his office uh, offer and went to Toronto, and I wrote that game as another game called WizCalc while I was there. So after NABU was shuttered, and I was not no, no longer working on it, um, I ended up moving back to Ottawa in, in around 1989, 1987, sorry. And in 1999, I tried to pull all the stuff out and try to get it going. And I managed to get a cycle going with a cab serve unit and had some fun with it. And nobody was interested, so I put it all away. Um, in 2009, I, I, I cruise the internet looking for the word NABU like other people do these days. Um, and I uh, noticed that um, the New York University was looking for information about NABU. So I said, I can provide you everything. So I did. So I spent a couple weeks back then um, using a program called 22Disc and pulling a lot of the data off. But I didn't do, do anything with it. I ended up uh, uh, putting it all together and just shipping it off to York University. Uh, they ended up making an emulator with it. They made a site with it. And they put other stuff, and they have a display apparently at York University. I've never been there nor seen photos of it, so I don't know uh, how it actually works. Um, they created their own menu that they called Yun, the York University NABU Network. Um, and I guess it would be the first emulator. Um, um, and but and it does uh, from what I've, all, all 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 accounts it does work. I was sent a copy of the code a while back, but I didn't do anything with it because I wasn't really interested. I wasn't wanted to get my own NABU's working, and I just at the time I was busy doing other things, uh, and I thought that was the end of that. So that was when I showed up as a ghost, and I stopped haunting then. Then. We had the reunion at the Museum of Science and Technology, and that's me in the middle there, you can see, with the blue t-shirt and the Nabu hat. Uh, that's Bob McNally to the left, that's Dave Allen over there. I think John Kelly is somewhere in there, but I can't see him, but he's, oh yeah, he's way in the back there. That's his head back there. But yeah, he was definitely there, and we hooked up again. We had a lot of fun, uh, and a lot, a lot of good conversations. So, in, March of, uh, in, sorry, June 28th, 2022, John Kelly died. I was kind of taken aback because I hadn't seen him in a few years. And um, I thought that that was pretty much the end of the NABU era. I thought that I wasn't going to bother doing anything. Nobody was interested. Um, and John Kelly was dead. And he was the chief cheerleader of doing this again. He considered NABU the jewel in his crown. Um, he considered it one of the his his favorite things that he ever did. Every time I talked to him, he was always never. What are you doing with it again? And I'm embarrassed to say I could do much um, to him most of the time. So that's pretty. Um, uh, that's all I have to say about that. Um, and then in that in in October, I found out that there was somebody was selling somebody named Pell Mill LLC started selling piles of Nabus. At 100 at a time for 69 bucks and $50 shipping US. Um, so now people are buying non bootable NABU PCs and trying to figure out what to do with them. 
In November 2022, Adrian Black, a popular retro streamer, purchased one of the eBay Nebu units and made a video about it. I commented on the video that I had all the software for. Tim Ranger actually poked me in an email to take a look. That led me to DJ Schur's channel and started to look around. It looked like he was getting somewhere and tried to get in touch with him, so I ended up looking for him on LinkedIn. I sent him a simple connection request. Connect with me and I'll make all your Nabu dreams come true. So he did, and I did. The ghost of Nabu past haunts again. He made an Nabu adapter that could load the software I saved for 40 years and helped kick off a revival of a computer long thought dead. DJ's father was one of the founders of Nabu, and his uncle was also one of the founders of Nabu. So that makes it kind of convenient. He also knows a lot about it, and he has access to a bunch of prototype equipment that, similar to the stuff that I have as well. So it's interesting just talking to him on the phone about different things and telling him about different things from my point of view, and he tells me things from his point of view. So uh, in also in 2009, I had registered the domain nabu.ca, thinking that if we were going to catalog this stuff, this is where I was going to put stuff. I actually, at that time, created a thing called Nabupedia, and, but it quickly got overrun with spammers, so I got rid of it. Uh, but I have some of the data from it. I'm planning to get some of the data out of it. And in the meantime, we use nabu.ca as the home base where he puts all of his stuff up there. He puts my stuff up there. And we also made a forums.nabu.ca so we can discuss all of the things that he's working on, the stuff that I'm working on, and the stuff that other people are working on who want to get commentary from us. So that's all wonderful fun that we're having right now. So what else has happened? Well, um, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Clyball has reproduced the floppy disk controller so that people can run the, uh, floppies again and they can buy off-the-shelf drives and use some of the software that I pulled out of my personal collection uh, so that they can run CPM again. CPM is now license-free, so that's wonderful. Um, Santo got the CPM, the Santo Noctifera of uh, VintageComputer.ca got the CPM images running, and that was really, really cool too. So that really helped. I managed to uh, copy out six different boot ROM copies, and people are using those to develop a, a ROM switcher so they can switch between them, plus new ones that they make themselves. Um, other uh, uh, Brian Johnson made a Nabu Mame emulator. He had a, a talk about, about, I can't really say much about it. All I can say is that I do use it. Obviously, I use it uh, when, I'm, when I'm getting screenshots and stuff like that, and when I'm moving software back and forth. And I also use it to access Cloud CPM when I'm just trying to check things out. Um, so in, in the case of uh, uh, DJ, he also made Cloud CPM and so on so that we could work on stuff like that. And not only that, he's also made video games like Game Man, yeah, and some other ports, and other people have made Tetris ports, uh, Production Dave, and a bunch of other people. So this, all of this is, is, is starting to pick up. This is new stuff that's being developed for Nabu that's not in the category of the old stuff uh, that I'm, that, the world that I'm living in. So there's a whole pile of people doing MSX games like, that I've noticed. And, uh, uh, and uh, there's also other sites like nabunetwork.com, and there's tons of GitHubs. You just have to look for for Nabu on GitHub, and you'll find lots of them there. There's really too much that I can that, that, that I can talk about in this particular presentation. It's very easy to go look for it, um, and uh, 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 th we we can go on all day about talking about all the new Nabu projects. And uh, I think that's a go that, that's more of a ghost of Nabu present uh, type of story. So what's left there to do? Well. Uh, I'm still working on nabu.ca, and I'm trying to get all of that, all those 192 floppies archived. This has proved to me the biggest bane because I really don't know what I'm doing. So I have a grease weasel, and I have an MFM emulator, and I've been pulling images off, but I haven't been able to get data off of those images. So I'm going to have to change my approach, but I've, I, 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 I've been having a lot of requests for my time, so I've got to get to that project eventually. Um, my next one is to get the source code for Pac-Man Qbert Minor 249 are released. Pac-Man need a little bit of work. I've discovered that I actually didn't have quite everything, and I tried to put it together. So I'm going to end up, I'm going to end up just uh, putting it up on GitHub and describing how it works and showing people how to build it, and hopefully we can get all the pieces together in a final release. Um, I have there's some other applications that I would like to recover off that uh, hard drive uh, with the uh, MFM em emulator. Uh, I'm really hoping I can get some of them because Manager Baseball is one cool baseball game, um, and it was one of our, one of our really really good showcases of Nabu technology because we loaded multiple segments to do 
uh, all its work. Um, there's other uh, source code, like uh, uh, a, a partial source code that I have, things that I was working on that uh, that I don't have the whole thing for, like Manage the Baseball, like um, Music Maker, like Paint Pot, and a few other games. So, I'd like to thank a bunch of people for putting this together. DJ Shures for helping me out with a lot of the information that I have. I was gathering this. Santo Noctifero at VintageComputer.ca for some of the 1100 images and yanking some of the old software off. Brian Johnson for the Mabu name emulator. Thank you. I haven't thanked you enough for it. Um, um, but, I, but, but, but I can't say a lot about it because I don't work with it besides working in it. Um, and my, my daughter Pamela for making me this wonderful Nabu shirt with this great Nabu embroidered logo. Ooh, feels good. Um, and finally, my lovely wife, Lisa. Thank you very much. I love you, dear, because you put up with all of these, uh, uh, well, this weird studio set up at my desk and listening to me bark about Nabu all day long. Nabu, 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 that's all you ever hear. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, this is uh, 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 this is this is more of a reprise of the previous uh, 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 presentation that didn't go so good at the, uh, the uh, Ver uh, Vintage Computer Federation Festival. Um, but hopefully, this will give everybody the information that I try to do. And it's actually a little bit longer; it's expanded because I cut stuff out to make the forty minutes. So I ended up putting it back in so that you could see some of the stuff that I still had um, that I wanted to talk about. But anyway, this is the, the this is the, the actual Nebula emulator, and by by Bry John, and um, so this is what allowed me to take a bunch of the screenshots and so on. But this is the main menu of, of Nabu as it was displayed, and I'll just uh, uh, there's a uh, there's an opening animation that won't play because I'm restarting it, and I don't want to restart it and make it all disappear. So, um, but there's a nice little open animation, but this is the, the, the actual menu that we had. And if you notice, we tried to make Nabu look a lot like a, um, the idea was we were trying to marry computers and video technology together. We, VCRs were heavy on our minds. So we were trying to make it very much like a VCR menu. Um, and we had paging buttons and, and up, down and that kind of stuff. But normally when I was looking for stuff, I would, uh, uh, look, th look through them here. So if I was going to run Pac-Man, for instance, I would do them in a shortcut just because I'm the command line kind of guy. Um, so and as I mentioned before, Pac-Man was my first game, but I would spend a lot of attention to detail, even doing the attract mode in the game, just that this was, just to make sure that it was exactly the same. Um, but the other thing was, is that if you, ever, if you ever see the MSX Pac-Man, you'll notice that um, The way I do that is I bring game so I spend a lot of time with Earth and I spend time on a particular uh, thing, probably like two or three weeks. And it was one of the favorite things that uh, uh, um, Namco ever had. So and and it was it was all, it was it was a lot of fun to do. So the uh, Pac-Man took a good portion of my life. It still does now, <laughs> but uh, but at the time I, I spent about six months on it, and it wasn't that I was uh, working on it. I remember I was working part time, but I was working on another game. Roulette was my first game, so Pac-Man sort of took a backseat to that. So it emerged over a course of six months. I had the luxury of doing that because uh, the rights were being being talked about for that period of time. So. I, we didn't even know we'd had it. I might have had to change it to something completely different. And I, and in fact, I was prepared to do that. I, I could change the maze around. I could change the characters around um, and, and do whatever I wanted with it. Because if they, it, everything fell through. Um, but, and so what happened was at some point, so this is uh, on YouTube, this is DJ's site. And you can see that uh, he's got tons of, he's up to this is a little of the history of him putting it up together and not easily and videos. But a lot of it has gone in more detail. So this video here where at some point I was working with DJ and I couldn't get the software to work. So I started looking at all my ROMs, all six of the ROMs on all six of my machines are all completely different. They're all 
uh, uh, so I dumped them all and people are using them and playing with them. Some of them support hard drives, some of them support floppies, some of them support neither of those, uh, some of them are prototypes, uh, but it was really weird to find that. Um, and I have a bunch of hardware as well that, that, that I have showing here. And I'd really like to get all of it to work. That big, huge system there that's, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's on this one here, um, that, 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 that's the cab serve unit. That hard drive has failed. If I can read that hard drive, I will be, get, be able to pull off a whole pile of other games. But I haven't been able to do that. I suck at hardware. And I haven't been, in all these months, I haven't been able to find anybody to really help me dissect what's going on with this. This is a, um, a um, Seagate ST450 with a Tandon 1000 controller. And if I could get the software off this, there will be much more riches to have. I'm pretty certain we can have like ATC tennis and so on because I only have like 80% of the cycle so far. That means there's a whole pile of games and there's some really, really, really good games. Like for instance, uh, Manager's Baseball is like rotisserie baseball, but it made ex exquisite use of, of, of the Nabu cycle because we had player rosters from different years in the um, uh, uh, in, in the cycle so you could pick like at the time it's 1980s so you could pick like cal ripken and dave winfield and that kind of stuff as as players but it was a really good game it was, it was the first game so you could run the play and and manage everything and it was um and as i said it was one of the first updatable games like that made unique use of the cycle i really really liked uh uh, uh trying to get that stuff. So uh, as you can see, I have all kinds of other junk too. I have cables and that kind of stuff. People are reproducing them. So there's uh, there, there, so, so while we, uh, well, so, so while we have the emulator uh, uh, on one side in software, there's people like there, there, there's another site, nabunetwork.com. They're creating their own adapters and they're creating other software. And there's a big enthusiast community, some that are on Discord. And they're uh, creating brand new stuff. And some people even sent me new hardware things to diagnose the NABU. Uh, some, uh, somebody mailed me a Wi-Fi modem to try, all of which I said, I got, I'll try that in months when I get everything working. But right at the moment, it's nice to, to see that everybody's excited about it. And that's the best part. There is nothing, nothing like seeing 40-year-old software that you wrote running again and people enjoying it. And not just running again, but actually people using it, to, wanting to play it and 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 have fun with it. And that's kind of nice. I'd like to see more of that. Not just the uh, the NABU uh, computer enthusiasts, not just the retro community, but the, all the subscribers that were here in Ottawa, when they find out about the fact that they can play it again, you'd be surprised. There was at least 30,000 units out there. So there'll be a bunch of 40 and 50 year olds. They're going, oh my God, I really want to play this and I want to deliver it to them. I want to see that, that happen here in Ottawa. And is there a question here? I'm kept running out of time, so just uh, see if there's anything more. Because I have uh, actually, I've got tons of stories if you want to keep on hearing them. All right. Anybody have any questions? You guys still there? Yeah, we're still here. Yeah. You can hear us? Yes, I can. All right. Uh, any questions? Doesn't look like there's any questions. You still have 11 minutes. <laughs> Oh, well, geez, if you want to keep on going, I can go. Okay. Yeah, let's go another 11 minutes. More stories. Okay. More well, stories. you see, here, here's the thing. I created about three hours of material in a big file, um, and I called it <laughs> to do this. That's why I moved pretty fast. So um, uh, let me find the other really good story that I wanted to um, – um, so uh, uh, I'll talk. I'll talk about Cuber, uh, Minor 2399er for a sec. Um, I worked on Minor 2399er with uh, Joaquin Fernandez. He started at NABU in that that he, that, that heady summer of uh, uh, 1983, and I was really excited to work with him. For the, the reason was he was the most meticulous programmer I've ever met. He was like a, a an old style systems programmer. You know, a guy that does everything on graph paper with flow charting templates and stuff like that. Everything is all mapped out. It was great. It was a lot of fun. It was completely different from my style because I'm more freeform. Just put me in front of the editor and stuff starts flowing out. Uh, and and he complete he designed his portion of, of, of uh, uh, Minor Tree for Niner exceptionally. And what we did is we completely carved it out. Uh, I uh, ended up doing all the sprite stuff and the scoring and stuff like that. 
Um, and he did all the background stuff in the building of the, of, of the patterns. I also did all of the gadgetry, like the cannons and these transporters and all of this and, and the elevators and lifts that, that, that happened in it. Now, remember, we never got a lick of code from anybody. We didn't get any code. The, the, the only time that we got stuff was when we were doing MSX computers happening over the summer. We had um, after that, the thing we had a little bit different for keyboard and just that we also had a pretty easy with the post conversions. That was a lot of fun too. And because of the modern scratch, I didn't have it to work with. I'm hoping that he'll he'll dis, uh, decide to do a pre-recorded uh, presentation and then do live Q and A. So I'm going to talk to him after the talk um, to see if that's possible because that's going to work a lot better. <laughs> well, recording in and progress. Then we ended up um, um, paying, giving a kid a quart. We had a roll of quarters, a roll of tokens actually, and we gave a, 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 one to a kid, and he literally played. Cubert for the next hour and a half on that one token. It gave us so much footage. It was excellent. We, we ran out of tape. So um, that we, that would gave Tim Ranger and I the ability, we both watched that religiously and we both worked, uh, we didn't even work side by side. That's what was kind of neat because we could just wander over to each other and we were really good at figuring out what she, each other were thinking. And uh, we, once again, like, like, like with, with Joaquin, uh, we carved out our, our domains. I did all the Sprite stuff. He, uh, sorry, I did all the patter stuff. He did all the sprite stuff, and uh, uh, he did all the, the final integration. I asked him later. I said, "Did you put a, did you put a, an Easter egg in there?" And and he he couldn't remember. So, but I went and looked in the code, and I can't find one. So I, he he didn't manage to get an Easter egg in that one. That's why I'm saying, Kubert, there's no Easter egg. But I do know there's ones in uh, Pac-Man, my minor 49 or Kubert, and I'm a hundred percent certain people put them in their own games. But I wasn't there for. The, I'm just going to leave the When Nabu was sort of on the shoestring, um, we also had. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the things that we were doing were really really cheap ways to do it, but we got a lot of games out. So we had a few conversions left that we were that were in the can that we finished. Uh, when I was uh, uh, one was Mind uh, Minesweeper, another one was Dragonfire. So we actually released new games even when we had no money left. And we were still putting out games, and we did other neat things as well to save money. Like uh, we used to get. Um, 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 things like horoscopes and 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 so on from uh, King Features, uh, same place we got the BC and Wizard of Id connection. But they used to give us uh, like Dear Abby and so on, and we'd had a few titles that were like that. I can't even remember what they were. Uh, the in information titles, um, stuff that that you would see on a, on a Teledon network or Minitel or something like that. But they were just uh, uh, like news, and we had daily news and that kind of stuff on it. So. Uh, we also had, at some point, Amway was distributing us, and we had an Amway application for them as well, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Um, they used to, they, but they used to like our place because they used to meet there and we had lots of Naboos and that kind of stuff. So, they, but uh, that was right when at the very end. And the great part about Amway is that they were selling subscriptions, um, but they were just taking commission, so it didn't cost us anything to do that. But it, 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 the, 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 the way of before we were having kids sell subscriptions of the phones and that was working fine too. I thought that that, that, that actually was cheaper in the long run, but I wasn't sure about that because they paid them. Oh, what else do I got? Well, actually, let me wrap it up here because I have a couple of other things I'd like to say, but um, it'll take me a little bit longer to think about them. <laughs> so um, I, th I think we're doing pretty well on time. So I think we should, let, let's, unless we have any other questions about any of these other great things that I was talking about. All right, last chance we'll for questions. All right, yes. Uh, are we done? <laughs> well done. Um, I guess. Okay. Well, well did, did you hear that question? Thanks. 
No, I didn't hear a question. What All right, yeah. The, so I was uh, hold on. So the, he said you're talking about Pac-Man and some other games. Did you have to worry about licensing for all of that? Um, million and a half in royalties initially, and some and 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 ongoing royalties. That was for Pac-Man, Dig Dug, and Galaxian. But the, the initial fee was that much. I know that because I saw I had still the press release somewhere. Um, so yeah, we had to we have to pay license, but in some cases. A lot of cases, when we started to do MSX things, we were doing, uh, we were gearing up to swap the titles. Like we were going to, we, we were licensing MSX games, but we were going to cross license other ones. Like uh, the Konami and uh, ASCII Microsoft in Japan were planning to resell ours and convert them to Japanese right? and, and, and so on, on the MSX systems. So we did, while well, we did worry about them, we had a whole team of people that were doing them. Uh, so all of the stuff that we did at the time were licensed, whether it was from Konami, whether it was from Epix, or whether it was from Namco. Answer your question. Any all right. other questions? Yeah, any more questions? Looks like that's it, Leo. Um, we thank you for your talk. Um, we did have a lot of glitches here, um, uh, <laughs> firewall internet issues, so... Maybe we can talk later. Maybe you could do some sort of pre-recorded one, and then we can have like live Q and A, so we can talk about that later. Sure. All Let, right. Let's figure out a way to get this done without the streaming. It's just recording because it's much easier to to do recording. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you, Leo. All right, everyone, give him a big hand. <laughs>